The following voicemail messages were sent between Michael and Andy over a number of days and contained spoilers. You know who you call. Leave a message. Maybe they'll call you back. Then again, maybe they won't. We're having ourselves quite a little game of phone tag here. Ring, ring, ring. Uh, I usually get this guy's answering machine. I'll call you right back. If you're there, please pick up the phone. I really want to talk to you. I check my fucking messages every day when I come home from work. My answering machine, zero. I got a blinking light. All I have to do is pick up this phone right here, inform the cinema, and your plan's kaput. No, I ain't got no phone. I had to pull, you know, because people call all the time, and uh, who needs the aggravation, right? Interruptions. Hey, man. Um, I watched hundreds of beavers last night on your recommendation. Uh, and uh, it's already a movie I was interested in. I'd seen it uh, on an Instagram feed or two. Like, pe- kind of that classic sort of very few people are going to see this movie, but the people who do see it are going to really champion it kind of thing. So I had curiosity about like seeing something a bit out of left field. And I know you really enjoyed it. Um, have to say, did not connect with the movie at all. Uh, well, at all is maybe a, an exaggeration, but I think when it comes to comedy, it's probably the hardest genre to recommend. Like, um, there's obviously loads of comedy that we both love, but just because one of us loves something comedic doesn't mean the other one will. And with this kind of like really silly humor, there is a like how much does it agree with your sense of humor, and then b are you in the right mood for it? Um, on neither counts did I line up with the movie in a way that was going to make me like it. But um, yeah, found it very silly. I was trying to think like, yeah, what's the silliest comedy that I love? And I, I love Monty Python. There's definitely big Monty Python energy in this. Um, and I love Dumb and Dumber. I wouldn't say there's much crossover with Dumb and Dumber, but they're both like very silly. But there's just something about the added silliness. Um, I don't know. Just It just didn't work for me. I'm, I'm even a big fan of Charlie Chaplin, who, um, you know, there's certainly crossover there, both in like the fact that it's like a black and white slapstick comedy, but also just the fact that it's like rooted in poverty and early America and stuff like that. There's a lot of Charlie Chaplin kind of themes going on. And like the girl that he falls in love with, but you know, there's nothing to the relationship other than he sees her, he falls in love with that. You know, it, it really kind of hits on a lot of the stuff that I've liked in other things, but yeah, didn't do it for me at all. Um, <clears throat> now I found it interesting because it's very rare that I see a film that's just completely coming from completely outside of any kind of film industry like any kind of structure it, usually you might see like a low budget film from australia or something like that but it actually feels very rooted in an industry you might not have seen films from that industry but all it's you know you've got all the professionals working in it are like working on generic stuff and it all just feels very cut from the same cloth as all other films even if you see a film from a country you've never seen a film from before it's it's usually like walking in lockstep stylistically with like other films that you've seen and not even just stylistically but just like the filmmaking technique everything like that is just quite homogenized across cinema and this was like one of the only times in recent years that i can think of probably one of the only times in my life where i've seen a film that just felt like it was just completely outside of any kind of structure um, now, I, I don't know much about the making of the film. It, that actually might not be true, but that's the impression I got. And I, it was it felt like, you know, outsider art or like someone, you know, a group of people just doing their thing. I found out afterwards that it's not directed by the lead actor. I, I had assumed it was because it felt like very much like a, you know, almost like The Room, where it's like, no one's going to believe in this project, but the guy making it. So the, he's got to like just do everything but actually <laughs> apparently someone else did believe in it but it's co-written by the director so i guess the two of them the actor and the director who co-wrote the movie together they're you know worked very closely together on it <clears throat> um and it got a few smiles at me like i'm a huge cartoon fan i'm a huge fan of old weather 
like Looney Tunes. Um, basically, everything that this film is drawing from, I'm a fan of. But of course, it's not just it's not just um, like if you add up all those ingredients, you get this film. It's got very much its own identity with the use of the sort of mixed media, like crude CGI, like deliberately so, like just very um, punk rock almost in its like roughness. Um, I found that interesting. Like just, it, it actually reminded me of Georges Méliès uh, a lot where it's like tricks almost, like you're, you're watching... In the case of Georges Méliès, I think he was like trying to make people not know how it was achieved, like it was wizardry because people were so unfamiliar with any kind of filmmaking at that point. This doesn't feel like it's um, it's not like Michel Gondry or something where it's doing like tricks that you can't quite figure out. It's more um, crude than that, but it, you know, kind of ecstatically crude because it did it doesn't care at all about um, making some sort of finessed aesthetic and. I enjoyed watching it. I was like, okay, so here he's on blue screen, but then in the next shot, he's really in snow. But this snowman beside him isn't there in snow, and that snowman's just like flat textures with like a little bit of shading on the side. But then this other thing is like a CG model, and like just the trees there are copy and pasted. But then this shot is real trees, and it. I liked how um, visually not noisy because it all actually like runs together quite well but how how just how visually striking it was i guess there's just it's so overwhelming with so many techniques so many different assets like pulled from different kind of um crafts like methods both digitally and you know in with real props and stuff like that yeah the it was it was interesting to watch the film and kind of break apart the filmmaking. I think like the the key thing, the the thing that's made a lot of people really fall in love with this movie is that they're laughing the whole way through it. And they're just really really enjoying how funny it is, and that wasn't the case for me. So I was I was relegated to just sort of focusing more on the filmmaking of it, which is very interesting, um, but not the experience that the film is going for per se. Uh, so like that that's why the film i would say didn't do it for me um but but it still was worth watching on that basis in fact afterwards i again i was assuming that the lead actor was the director which is not the case but i looked him up to see what else he had done and there's a, a movie that's like a hundred like saying an hour and 20 minutes i think and it's sort of like an ahab seafaring movie um bizarrely <laughs> 100 beavers cost 150,000 whereas the, the other one cost something like 7,000 which i think is the budget of el mariachi but you know 7,000 back then probably like what like 40,000 or something so micro 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 budget his other one and somehow from the trader looks like equally as visually arresting it it does look more down and dirty like it doesn't look quite as professional um i guess hundreds of beavers they have like a lot of costumes and yeah there's a there's there's more going on i suppose but i liked it's a movie i wanted to like more because like i i love the spirit of it i love the intention behind it i love the ambition of it it's one of the most ambitious movies i've seen in a long time like you, you know that this to me is a lot more ambitious than let's say Dune one and two, where it's like, yes, you have infinite money, infinite access to the absolute best people in every single discipline. You've got thousands and thousands of people working on the film. Um, yeah, it's impressive, but like, it's basically like, let's pull together all the world's resources to make the best, like the most epic, impressive uh, thing that we can put on screen. Whereas this is like. Let's take a, f a handful of people who are like outsiders who uh, really are, are given very little access to anything. I mean, I think it was all made on After Effects and apparently the guy took like years to raise the money to make it. Like it's it's no one, no studios queuing up to make this movie. And yet they still have just so much going on in the film. Like 
right down to the end where he goes to the beaver's headquarters which feels like something like the end of lord of the rings or something like they really you know got all out with the epic narrative didn't always work for me the narrative like it was it was you know mostly clear because there's not much going on in it but there was some things where it's like okay this could be tightened up a little bit um also fascinated by the choice to have um the movie start with the telling us who's in it and who made it then about halfway through the movie give us a sort of title sequence not but not a title sequence just like the stars and then three quarters of the way through the movie give us the title of the movie like the actual title card that's uh I want, you know with things like that you're like is that um someone just sort of not even caring about how things are normally done so they just just like okay i'll just put it here and they're not even it's almost like a subconscious decision or is there a deliberate subversion of expectation uh, and i kind of don't want to read too much about the people who made it because i don't want to break the magic like i don't want to break the spell of these are just complete outsiders like i remember um that great documentary american movie one of my favorite documentaries one of my favorite films about filmmaking full stop and the guy who's making the film i think the film's called coven like you just want him to succeed and make this movie because you want there to be people out there making movies on their own terms not just making movies to sort of fall in line with um the established film industry and and yeah kind of like the mystique of of these guys just out there you know they're not on on a coast they're doing their own thing and i hope I, as far as i'm aware the, the film was self-distributed as well which seemed more crazy um but i hope that this the success of this film uh, will make let's say netflix for example just threw them a million dollars that would make, allow them to like increase the budget like sevenfold to to netflix that's just like buying lunch for robert de niro or something so they're just like okay you know off you go um do your thing and we don't really care like we know that this is going to make back a million dollars in terms of like streaming revenue so if it takes you 10 years to make it like whatever and it's not really big there's no jeopardy like i hope something like that happens with them and they're just kind of allowed to just comfortably earn a living just making these interesting little films on their own um so there's a lot i have a lot of affection for the film and the filmmakers without actually having really enjoyed the film all that much which is a very unusual outcome of a movie but uh yeah it's just the silliness of it that just i couldn't connect with and like you know like let's say the bit my probably one of my favorite running jokes in it was like when he goes and then the little woodpecker comes and pecks him and it's like the repetition of that gag over and over again that's pure looney tunes and it and i love that type of stuff in looney tunes and looney tunes is incredible like building on jokes and layering it and all this kind of stuff and it felt like when i was watching this i would i was almost like i'd rather be watching looney tunes uh but still yeah got a lot of respect for the film and i'm i'm curious about that other film now that i know it's a different director then i'm like okay let's see what else this stable has um and also maybe the fact that I didn't really like a hundred or hundreds of beavers will it's kind of not be a mark against this other movie the other movie looks much more like chaotic in its in its cinematography and it's like very like handheld cameras close-ups into people's faces like almost looks like a Beastie Boys music video or something and um it's also got like shit loads of dialogue whereas hundreds of beavers is almost completely silent so yeah worth watching for me but uh, unfortunately didn't have the experience you had where i just like absolutely fell in love with the movie yeah man gone out for lunch with bobby de niro cost you a hell of a lot of money to remortgage a house um before we go down to speculation of how much uh, a lunch with him would actually cost um uh, just getting back to you now in between the football. Good game. Between Georgia and Czech Republic. But uh, yeah, it's a shame that uh, hundreds of beavers didn't connect with you to the same level that it connected with me. 
I was actually going to rewatch it this morning in preparation for your glowing praise of it so we could we could join in on all the gags and all the things we loved about it and then I listened to your voice note and <laughs> I didn't bother rewatching it again because I'm like all right we're not we're not going to be enjoying all the many many brilliant moments of this movie yeah like I said for me it's a five-star movie fantastic experience I do accept that a significant amount of this movie is going to be based on your sense of humor and it is going to be based on how the jokes land and I pretty much presumed that they would land pretty well with you because of the the type of movies you like Monty Python and I presume you really like the Charlie Chaplin movies and the the Buster Keaton kind of movies I, I've I've barely seen those movies I, I've I've seen clips in passing and uh, things like that but just in how their spirit resonated in, in things like the Looney Tunes and Mr Bean and coming to it years later I just love this movie man like you mentioned when you were thinking of it and watching your, you were saying that oh this this reminds me of Looney Tunes. I'd rather watch the Looney Tunes. For me, this kind of falls into along the lines of I remember we watched Rafifi before, and there was things about we liked about it, and and there was things that were perfected way down the line. This movie feels way down the line of something like a Charlie Chaplin movie or something like a Looney Tunes cartoon, and even if I watch something like x-men 97 I, I i went back and tried to watch the old cartoon and i couldn't get into it and i i was thinking well that was then and that was the my child's appreciation and love for something that was aimed at a child and now i can't go back and it's and it's in a nostalgia kind of bubble and then i watch x-men 97 and i'm thinking okay that is taking that bubble and bringing it to people who are now watching this in their 30s and 40s and making it taking the essence of that and putting in something that i will love minus the nostalgia now and that's what i felt about this movie with the opening credits i was going to turn off the movie straight away because i wasn't quite sure what a movie it was i was on my holidays and i'm um just looking for something to watch and then the opening credits was rough I'm not going to lie. And then I was thinking, maybe I'm not in the mood for this now. Then I just waited a few more minutes and I just absolutely fell in love with this movie. It's basically a, a love letter to these silent movies and Looney Tune cartoons and updated for modern audiences, maybe. And from the beginning, it's just the, the level of unpredictable slapstick nature and hijinks and how it subverts what you think is going to happen and what does happen I was absolutely captivated by and on top of that like you mentioned that it does go it does come down to if you find the jokes funny and if you uh, if it nails the type of humour for you I'm not saying that I didn't find this funny constantly and I didn't totally jive with the, the stupidity of this type of humour, because I absolutely did, which got me on board. We often talk about getting on board for movies. But separate to that, I just found it so entertaining with what was going to happen next. And you talk about the beats within a movie, like there's a beat within a scene, a beat within an action, and a beat within a joke of this. It's the AK-47 of gags and what happens next and it wasn't so much that I was laughing at them all the time it was just in my brain was trying to understand the and I'm getting too pretentious like the 
the cinematic language of what was created before me. It's a silent movie. I, I'm not an expert on silent movies now. I, I'm so far from an expert, but if there's no dialogue, you have to develop your own language through this movie and your own your own world and the, the world building of this is in, in terms of what to expect and what happens is absolutely fantastic like to to begin with he falls down a hole and then later on this hole leads to another like, location and then this hole leads to this location and, that, and like separate to if you find that funny or not it, it's constantly building what you expect is going to happen in each scene and then later on when he when in terms of the plotting and, and what he sets out trying to do, what's been established earlier plays into that. And like you mentioned, one of your favourite gags was the the bird whistling and the bird's whistles and pecks him on the head just when he's about to eat. And that, and that's initially funny, I find the hilarious and then he forgets. And then the bird pecks him and then later on the the scene absolutely moves away from that. And and later on it's like, oh yeah, that's what happens if you whistle in this world. So for me, and like again, um, I genuinely felt like that it was a masterpiece in in just creating a a completely new language within the context of that film in terms of what's going to happen. And that, that might be making it way deeper than it is. But for instance, if we get that, when you whistle, a woodpecker hits you on the head. But later on, because we've established a woodpecker <laughs> will peck you on the head, he, he comes up with this whole plan to, to catapult himself out of a cave when he's investigating, when he's trying to steal these beaver, uh, well, he's trying to these beaver corpses and skin. Because he's already established that when you whistle, this happens. It allows the film to completely <laughs> set up a system where it's like, well, when he whistles, the beaver's going to come and peck this head. Uh, and then this is going to spin this pulley system that allows him to fly into the air. Stuff like that is absolutely fantastic to me. Later on, when, when these wolves are killing these these bears, uh, no, sorry, killing these dogs, we, we get the, the dogs at each campfire playing a game of cards. And because we expect the rhythm of that every night, regardless if I think that's funny or not, which I did, I'm still kind of waiting for the sight gag, waiting for just to see, oh, I wonder what that's going to be. And then when there's only one dog left, like he's, he's playing a completely different game. The sight gags were a gag a minute, and there's a scene with icicles and what might happen then, and I think he, he sneezes or something, and an icicle comes out of his mouth. And then we establish that these icicles will fall down at this particular at this particular moment to do a trap and then that doesn't happen but then we establish that it doesn't happen because of this set reason and it's just constantly going with things like that and just how that's then interpreted in the movie through the actions are fantastic and even when he goes to the guy who owns the shop his gag with the <laughs> with the the tobacco spitting like it's not going to go in every time like like to me, it's beyond funny. It, 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 it's just adding to the language and the, the internal drama, even though it's, it's far from a drama, into every scene that, okay, now he's getting annoyed about this. And then it's like a full stop or when a comedian puts a addendum, if that's the right word, at the end of every joke. like every every It's like a, a punctuation mark at the end of every joke so you know this is the end of this moment. And then ha- how the... How the movie uses the the tobacco spit not getting into the bucket at that time to uh, add to that moment is fantastic. And trying to think what other moments. I mean, there's so many moments of that in in the movie, but there's 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 so many particular mini scenes like that where it just, it just adds to it. There's another scene where he's trying to catch these rabbits, and each time. He has to make sure that these particular mechanisms work in this way in order for that to happen, which is fantastic. And, and, and this gets me on to something else that I think is amazing about the film as well. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing about this movie is it takes it to another level that it, it didn't matter for me if I'm laughing at every scene. It's that this reminded me, and again, I, I don't want to look up the creators and, and get too into it because I, 
I also couldn't find so much information about that. This is almost a, an RPG at times. It, it It's kind of the first time I've seen genre elements from a game. And again, I could be wrong. This mightn't be the director's interpretation, but this is my interpretation based on watching it. So it, it's interesting like when an artist has a, a vision and then the, the audience interprets that vision based on what they see but this is what i got from this game there's so many rpg elements to this uh, and gaming elements in, in general that uh, seems massively influenced by to me in the sense that he starts off with very little tools and he has to get this item from an innkeeper as well which is very an uh, rpg like in order to get to the next level and almost level up should i say and we get him having to do these various little mini quests in order to get enough uh, beaver skins to get this item. And for me, that, that's so RPG-like. And so when he's going around to these different areas and locations in order to complete these tasks, in order to level up in the game, in the, in the sense of a movie, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And... It's not just an RPG as well. Think about it when he gets the map and he's got to... <laughs> There's a great scene early on where... Uh, like, Well, maybe not so early on, but he comes across this the fur trapper, like the expert. Oh, yeah, and that, not to go on a tangent before I continue my game thesis, but... There's a, there's a point where he meets the fur trapper and he's got one dialogue in the film when he goes, mush, mush. And even that's used in, in multiple ways. Like, it, it's, like I said, it's beyond funny to me. It's, it's like a scene of Rick and Morty where this one character kept, keeps on saying bitch. And he says, bitch, bitch. And then at the end he goes, bitch. And it's like just one word, but your, your tone and meaning changes every time. And there's a scene where the, the fur trapper, something happens to him that he hands the fur trapping map over. And then he goes, mush. But it's a dramatic, sad mush because something's about to happen. That's brilliant. That's the, the communication in this level. What I, in this uh, movie, what I manages to communicate is, is... I just absolutely in love with it. And yeah, getting back to my game, video game kind of influence on this. It's almost like a point-to-click adventure when he starts mapping out his own map. And he starts going to these locations... And he has to almost keep on going around in loops. And each scene doesn't quite work. And he hasn't quite cracked each scene until he's done this and he's got this item. And he keeps going to different these locations. But it's almost like a, a broken sword game or a Lucas Arts game. And the fact that it's a silent movie and the artistic choices that you've so articulately put that, that I couldn't because I know that's your jam. The, the, the way that feeds into it as well. So it's it's not just... A, uh, it's, it's far from coming down to how much humour you found in it to me. Although, of course, that feeds into it and enhances every scene. I'm not denying that. But yeah. And then later on, it almost has platformer elements. When he gets to the, the beaver camp. And he has to do all these kind of moves to get, to get through these, these various wood puzzles or whatnot and and to see that incorporated into a movie an asylum movie that is, is a love letter to these so many different things but i've never seen anything like it and and when we get to the final third and it starts getting like a, i said to like to you like you were thinking about watching furiosa which maybe you wish you did now that the, the final turn of this is like Mad Max Fury Road. It's like a crazy chase movie with all these beavers and absolute madness. And something like Godzilla or Pacific Rim or... Yeah, I, I just love that we got a film like this. And I, I just love that... We, we were talking the other day that... Where has there been a moment lately, like a, a train spotting moment where there's been something visual or something that different there's something that makes you think these people exist completely outside their own bubble completely outside 
that I'm going to make a movie like this person, like like a movie we talked about a few weeks ago, the last stop of humor, whatever it was called, like where this is my Tarantino impression. Although this takes elements from a lot of different cinema, this 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 exists completely in a vacuum to this own thing. It's this own person. And its use of music is fantastic as well. It, which again is kind of reminiscent to a, a video game, but also movies. There's, when he every time he walks past the bee, beaver camp where they're building this big structure, we get this apocalyptic kind of epic music. And then when he when he starts advancing in his in his quest, we get this really uplifting like da na 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 na. Well, that was a bad impression of it, but yeah, I'm just absolutely in love with this movie, and yeah. I'll definitely be re-watching it again and keeping up with what they, they're they going to do next. And, and just a bit of uh, clarification, if that's the right word. for From what I've seen when I was looking this up, so it, it took four years to make. It uh, cost like 150000 About 40000 was based on the beaver costumes and whatnot, which... I was thinking that because I actually worked in a costume shop before. And I was thinking, fucking hell, the amount of costumes he has must have cost him a fair bit. But I, I, unless I'm mistaken with what you said, this is his first movie and he's done a few short movies before this, the director. And it is funny how we're so spoiled when we see one person in a movie and we're like, oh, well, obviously that's the director <laughs> as well. Obviously that's the... And obviously he did everything himself, but no, it's like that, like you said, that's an actor. And um, but as far as I know, unless I'm completely mistaken, this is his first feature length movie. And I think he's done like three or four shorts before that, but maybe maybe that got lost in your your answer machine message. Yeah, so just to clarify, I was referring to the actor. So um when I saw the movie, I assumed that the main actor was also the director which turned out not to be the case. Now, I understand the director, this is his debut. Um, like you said, he's made a few shorts. But the actor has directed a movie before, which is also black and white, which is also a throwback to, like, older style of movies from, like, you know, many, many, many years ago. Um, but a slightly different era than Hundreds of Beavers is throwing back to. So that that's what I was referring to. Um, can't remember off the top of my head what the name of that movie is, but it's, it looks quite different to Hundreds of Beavers in the cinematography style. Like I said, it's much more like chaotic and crazy, even though Hundreds of Beavers is one of the most visually crazy movies you've ever going to see in your life. But still, it's much more like handheld, shaky all over the place. And it's also, uh, from what I could see from the trailer at least, like non-stop dialogue and quite stylized dialogue and stuff. So that sets it apart. But that's what I was referring to. Yeah, I'm glad that you had such a great time with it. Um, I think it's a movie that has found people like yourself who just like have fallen head over heels in love with it and, and have really championed it. Um, and now it's probably getting big enough that it's meeting people like me who are like not loving it. You know, it's kind of just, it's it's getting over that hump of like almost no one has seen it and it will start to get a little bit of pushback maybe because I do think it is quite um, sense of humor dependence. Um, you actually mentioned Rick and Morty there in that, uh, in that, in those voice notes. And I remember like when it started and I was like, pretty much anything you recommend to me, I will like. But then when it started, I was like, I don't know about this. I don't know if I can do this. Um, I was thinking, well, the one thing that no one can recommend to you is comedy, right? Like you could, you could have a stab at it. And like you said, I like Monty Python, I like, you know, Charlie Chaplin, I like uh, certain things that are reference points that, that indicate that maybe I would like this. But ultimately, if, if you found something absolutely hilarious, that doesn't mean I'll find it hilarious. If you found something incredibly thrilling or incredibly heartbreaking or something, I'll probably get enough out of it to, to like it. But if you found something absolutely hilarious, I might not like it all. And, and I know um, Rick and Morty is a show that you enjoyed, if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a long time now, but um, you were kind of part of that uh, group of people who were very passionate about that show, I think. And I thought it was absolutely awful. And and again, it just comes down to like, I watched an episode of Rick and Morty, I don't laugh once. 
uh, maybe you watch an episode of Brick and Morty and you, you laugh a lot more. I don't know, but yeah, it's just, it, it, I think it is a comedy. Um, like we were talking the other day about dramedies, you know, movies like, uh, as good as it gets or Jerry Maguire, where it's like, it's funny, but it's also dramatic and it's a mixture of the two and everything. Um, then there's movies like Dumb and Dumber and, and I would say hundreds of beavers where it's just a comedy all the time. Like, yes, of course there's pathos or otherwise it's not going to be funny because it's like much of the comedy derives from that, like the, you know, human trying to triumph over adversity and that whole Charlie Chaplin character mold. But ultimately every like 20 seconds you're getting a joke so it's just a through and through comedy and if you don't find the comedy funny and i rarely found the comedy funny in this film then it doesn't matter how innovative or interesting it is you just it's very hard to connect with it because it's just asking you to find it funny every like 10 seconds um and if that if there's no friction there and you just are finding it funny then you can like get a little bit more um you can enjoy all the other elements more whereas i'm just sort of enjoying them academically almost but not like being swept away with the movie um i, I agree with pretty much everything you said though like the 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 way it builds the logic of the movie where it's like we establish one fact like he's falling through a hole or when he whistles the woodpecker comes and then we just build on that and layer on it and take it in all different directions i don't think that's new though that is cartoon logic like that's looney tunes at its finest it's like this thing happens when i do this thing Okay, but then this thing won't be there next time. And then I'm going to move over here, but it's also not it just kind of ev rephrasing it a million different ways and, and layering it and calling back to it and everything. It's it's rare to see it in live action. And nowadays it's rare to see it in cartoon also. But for many years, that was the language of cartoons. I feel like that's the main reference point for this movie is a certain era of cartoons. Um, and that to me was like, clear from the get-go when he's like bowling with the rabbits with the snowball it's inventive stuff like I, I i like that stuff and i don't need this film to have invented that it's like great to see it come back or to be attempted again and maybe this will lead to more things but um yeah it's it, it just wasn't working for me enough but i love the chutzpah of putting this movie together like just actually coming up with an idea that isn't being done at all and in live action really has never been done because yes it, you can compare this to Buster Keaton and stuff but it's not the same it's, it's it's very like when animation came along Looney Tunes and all that it killed off the live uh, the live action slapstick people like Lauren and Hardy and Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton they they couldn't do what animation could do so that was kind of the end of that era and this is like the first time that I can think of. I mean, there's there's certainly actors like Jim Carrey who've like taken a lot from what cartoon characters do, but to get a whole cinematic aesthetic, but an entire feature length film be utilizing that cartoon style, I can't think of another example of that. And that's really admirable that someone from nowhere, not some like oh, it's not like um you know, Linklater or Soderbergh decided as an experiment, let's try and do Looney Tunes. It's people like, with no one believing in them, with no real resources, just dedicating themselves to do it, and then doing it in a way that many, many, many people adore. And then I'm sure that, or I hope that the director is now going to be able to set himself up for another film without like spending years looking for funding. As, as long as he's willing to do it on, the, on another low budget so that's really great and like i said I, I respect this movie big time i respect like what they pulled off and what they set out to do and i think when it comes to sense of humor it's just so subjective like there's so much of my favorite comedy i think most people are going to find just super cringe and not funny at all and if i showed it to someone and they were like this is just fucking awful i wouldn't be like oh you just don't get it man. like i wouldn't be defensive or anything because it's just like well it's sense of humor what are you what are you gonna do like that if 
if you find something funny, find it funny. And and I did find some things funny in this. Like I remember when he's pushing that like big casket, that huge big wooden box down the snowy hill, and and he trips over and falls into the box and falls out. Actually, that's another point. I was wondering whether he was a stuntman. So I'm going through the movie. I don't know anything about it. I'm watching and I'm like going, I think he must be the director. I think he must be Tommy Wiseau. He really wrote it. He directed it. He starred in it. He produced it. He edited it. He did the whole thing because no one else would believe in this project. Now, I was wrong on that score, but I wonder if he if he has any background in stunts because there's a lot of stuff that happens in this movie. I'm not going to say it's like Jackie Chan level I can't believe someone did that. It's not. It's nowhere near to that level. But for a low-budget movie, there is a lot of things that happen in this movie that I'm like, that's a that's fairly physically demanding to do that. Like even like the bit I think um, the like at one point like that girl to sort of plays a prank on him and like throws her skirt over him and then the dad comes and he gets mad and he like grabs his shotgun and he's about to shoot and he just like hangs it away from her straight into a fence like back flips over the fence falling over it and like again i'm not saying this is one of the most impressive stunts i've ever seen in my life but there's just a lot of stuff where i'm like he's really 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 throwing himself literally into this head first and yeah i was very impressed uh by so much of what this film pulled off and the audacity of like just doing stuff like you know let's say that the flies in it that look so shit like by by no pun intended but they look so shit like just little circle with eyes and the buzzing wings but they're just like no that's what they look like every single fly is like these four frames looped and we just copy and paste them all and shrink them down if they're further away and that's what you're getting and like it's that kind of um just getting it done and lack of perfectionism and i don't mean that as like a backhanded compliment like this it, they were so it's so great the way they made this film shitty it's like no they they really like it's a tour de force with how much is it going on in this movie and how much they pull off but i also like the just sort of let's get it done like what whatever we can achieve will do even if that's incredibly limited um, so again, I keep coming back to it. It's respect more than enjoyment for me. Um, and it is just, like you said, absolutely jam-packed. Like there's m- more things happen in this film than maybe any film I've seen this year. Like it's just every minute you've seen a thing happen, an event play out, a little mini story. I agree that it's um, incredibly video game influenced. Uh, obviously like the the um, like having to get two beavers and one raccoon and that equals one you know that's all deliberately referencing video games and yeah like you said there's other sort of mechanical components to the film that seem to call back to video games probably deliberately if not deliberately then it certainly works in that regard kind of enters that pantheon of films that aren't video game adaptations but are video game movies so uh edge of tomorrow being like a prime example of that where you go okay most video game movies like tomb raider or something are awful and all that they are is just like a poor man's version of a a regular movie like a indiana jones or something but there's occasionally been movies that aren't video game adaptations but actually do do something interesting in terms of the two mediums speaking to each other so um what you want is like the one that's actually a video game movie and um, is in conversation with the medium of video games, but I'm not sure if there's been any. I haven't actually seen the Super Mario Brothers movie, so maybe that's the one, but um, nothing else springs to mind. There's also Wreck-It Ralph, which is about video games, but isn't an adaptation of a video game, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, uh, 100 Beavers. Um, I... I rarely watch a movie where I've never seen anything like it before and I always welcome that opportunity and it's a shame that it didn't work for me on the level it did for you but um, I'm still curious about checking out that other movie so again that's directed by the actor so it's not from the same director but I think they are high school buddies and their whole career is kind of like interlocked so it might be one of these things where like they 
say, getting turned to, to assume different roles within the projects that they do. I'm not really sure, but um, yeah, definitely interested to see where these guys go. Yeah, the the guy's name is Rylan Brixen Cole Muse. Now, I presume he gave himself the... <laughs> I presume he gave himself the moniker Brixen. So that ca- that sounds very stunt manny to me. But it could be a case of what you can do when <laughs> there's not too much health and safety in a in a movie. No, but I think I I think you did a very good, like an articulate job of 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 I guess navigating between what you respect and and your personal enjoyment like i i find often when i'm um when i'm looking at reviews and and i'm i'm like influenced by what to watch i'll um i'll hear things and it's like championing this but then you also wonder did you actually uh, in enjoy it and sometimes those two things can get meshed into the same the, the same rating I guess whereas like as you explained you, you didn't enjoy it and you didn't have a good time of it but you respect it but I feel like that's kind of two different things when it comes to this movie and I'm wondering is, is will we eventually get a disconnect like you said where where people are in love with the idea of this movie and in love with what they respect about the movie and kind of omitting the fact of, of like the enjoyment levels and um, now I'm not one of those people I genuinely f- fucking enjoyed the hell out of this movie and yeah I, I would be interested to see what <laughs> like he does next it's a very like DIY film it, it, and again not not a backhanded compliment like you mentioned, the flies and the maggots and the just the guys in the costumes. It's 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 very low budget Jim Henson in a way, isn't it? Like you said, the flies are going to be this, the maggots are going to be this, the the rabbits are going to be this, and that's what it is. And, and like I love it, and this is the aesthetic I'm going for. It's not just based on what. It's not just based on what I have in mind. It, it, it sorry, it, it is based on what I have in mind, and but with a, a budget that are, are things that I can actually do. But it, it seems very like genuinely creative as well. Like this, this person's mind is probably awash with really unique and quirky images. And like you said, I, I could recommend a lot of different movies to you. Like in a lot of different genres, and and we're very much aligned in general. But when it comes to comedy, it's kind of like music as well. Oh well, I'm I'm sorry your your ears didn't like that sound. Like it it, it it's very much like that. You know what I mean? It's like well yeah, well I can't I can't articulate or or make an argument for what sound your ear ears like. You know, like you, you can't. You can't make a critical argument based on that. And comedy is very much the same thing. Well, I'm sorry you didn't find that funny. And here's why you should find it funny. Like, that doesn't exist. You laugh at different things. <laughs> you know? But yeah. Fucking fun movie to talk about, though. Your mailbox is full. Please delete new or stored messages which you no longer need so that new messages may be received.